Welcome back to the afternoon session. I'm Mark Geyer. I'm the director of the Division of Extramural Research at uh, NHGRI, and I'm going to take over moderating this afternoon so that Eric can relax, which is an oxymoron if I ever heard one. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, just continue with the, uh, the approach that Eric uh, began and invite our panel members up and introduce uh, Sharon Terry, the President and CEO of the Genetic Alliance, who's going to moderate the panel discussion. Thanks very much, Mark, and, and thanks to the Planning Committee uh, for a really wonderful day so far, and I think the afternoon will be equally wonderful. Um, the brilliance of the Planning Committee, you, you all can uh, take your seats, um, is such that they uh, were wise enough to know that the people and the various forms of um, association with their own genomes needed to be part of this symposium as well. And I come to this um, because I have two children with a recessive disease called Pseudoxanthoma elasticum. I'm a college chaplain by, uh, by trade, uh, but now very much in this world and very happy to be part of it. Um, my, uh, I, I am also very much in association with all the information we watched this morning and waiting, just like much of the public, uh, for the kinds of solutions, therapies, tests, et cetera, that we hope to see. My brother died of glioblastoma multiforme, so I was happy to see that as an early uh, entry into the various programs. And then um, I'm very good friends with Progeria Foundation and several of the others that we've mentioned so far. I'm also a person who did 23andMe uh, almost as soon as it was available, um, and more recently enrolled in ClinSeq, which we're going to hear a little bit about today. So I'm very interested in uh, our own genome and what we can do with the information. I'd comment that I think collecting samples as we go, that certainly was mentioned several times this morning, uh, and said to be very difficult, will be just like many of the other things we thought are going to be very difficult. And that is, it won't be once we allow the right systems to be put in place, including the involvement of citizen scientists, people who understand that they need to be involved, and by that I really mean all of us, uh, that every one of us, especially through social networks, will begin to understand the importance of being available for science in various ways. Today we're going to hear from a number of individuals who have had their genomes um, sequenced and who have a great deal of interest in understanding this on an individual basis. And we're going to ask them to answer two questions in a very brief um, introduction that they're going to give us. Then we're going to ask them to ask each other questions. Uh, and then we're going to invite you to ask them questions. So this uh, particular panel, which lasts about one hour, is going to be a little more interactive than some of the other sessions. So you should be ready to ask uh, these individuals anything you want. Um, I'm also going to dispense with formal introductions and just give you their names and affiliations. Um, and I'm also going to give you the order in which they're going to appear, uh, although they're here already. Um, so first we're going to hear from um, Dr. Stephen Sherry uh, of the National Library of Medicine. Then we're going to hear from Rick Del Santro, from, uh, who's a ClinSeq participant. Um, we are also going to then hear from um, Misha Angrist who, from Duke University. And then finally from Dr. James Watson from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Again, each of them will take about five minutes to introduce themselves, and then we'll move into some conversation amongst them and then some questions from you. Uh, so Steve, if you could begin. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so I, I guess I would like to say you know, I'm excited about the promise of biology and genomics. And I've done this professionally for about 10 years, uh, 13 years at NCBI, where I run uh, or have helped develop variation resources, dbSNP and dbGaP being primary among them. And so I have had a, a scientific relationship with genomic information for my whole professional career and have watched with curiosity about how the consumer uh, reagents are being developed and what this could mean to me personally. Um, I have not participated in a medical research study before. Uh, but this year, uh, 23andMe uh, put the genome typing kits on sale for Christmas. And so I bought them for my family and thought that this would be something neat to give my parents as a, as a Christmas present. They have everything, you know, and so what do you give them? You know, now it's going to be an obsessive set of questions about, you know, their drug sensitivity to statins and to <laughs> all sorts of things. Uh, I haven't received my results yet, so unlike others on this distinguished panel, I don't have a lot to say about how this has changed my thinking. I can maybe speak briefly to why I decided to do this, aside from the trivial curiosity. Uh, I, in developing these catalogs, these resources at NCBI, we're very concerned about uh, the, the uh, relationship we have to participants in medical research studies. 
Uh, their volunteer uh, spirit, their trust is essential to the relationship in scientific research. And so we're trying to ensure that the, uh, the, the resources we develop at the Library of Medicine are responsive to their needs as well as to the needs of the research community. What we imagine is that going forward, genomics are going to be more uh, available to consumers, and, but it won't be every consumer that's coming forward to look for information. Most likely there's going to be a key person in each family who took biology in college or knows some genetics and will be the person that is the authority in a family relationship, the go-to person to say, interpret my genetic test. In my ex personal experience, my parents have come to me and said, you know, my father has a degenerative brain condition. What does this mean? You know, there's a test. And so I'm looking at OMIM now, not as a theoretical researcher making sure the information's complete, but trying to interpret the data personally for my own family members. Uh, and so I'm thinking that the more I can become engaged with 23andMe and these other uh, uh, information providers that are digesting information, that it will help us inform our design decisions and the uh, resources and the information structures we provide at the library because we're trying to serve everybody, taxpayers, include with the research community. It's kind of my overview. I'll stop there. Great. Thanks very much. Rick? Well, I come at it from a completely different angle. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a layman. Uh, my story is kind of interesting. I bought into the, the myth that if I was physically active, if I ate properly, if I kept my cholesterol in check and had low triglycerides, and you know, I was on the I was on the road to success. And having had a mother who died at age 69 during her third open um, heart surgery, having had a grandfather who died um, of heart disease as well, who was one of the first 100 people to get open heart surgery, I was always sensitive to that. And a few years back, I had a sister at the time was, I believe, 48 years old, and she started to feel not right. So she went in and she saw a, um, a doctor who sent her over to see a cardiologist. Long story short, she um, turned out that she had uh, three blockages. Two of them they stented, one they did not. And she strongly encouraged the family to go get checked. Now, I come from a large family. There's eight children. Um, interesting note, uh, my sister's cholesterol level, combined cholesterol level, was about 104 and remains there today without taking statins because she, her body doesn't do well with them. So anyway, uh, on that, I, I went to see my doctor who, you know, uh, again, I'd seen for years, just a regular practitioner who put me on a treadmill with an EKG machine, which basically was only going to tell me, I guess, if I was about ready to keel over from a heart attack. So I checked out fine and, and went home, and I had a brother at the time who was 38, cholesterol level roughly 150, low triglycerides, um, physically active, and he went in and got a, a nuclear stress test. Uh, they didn't like what they saw, did a catheterization. He went in for emergency double bypass surgery at the age of 38. So I panicked, um, went, saw a cardiologist, and he walked into the, uh, the room and Said, looked at my file and said, what are you doing here? And I said, look, you just let me tell you my story, and if you really want me to, to leave after that, I'll just leave. So I told him, and he thought it was interesting, and told me to go get a heart scan done, in which I did, and came back that my calcification was through the roof. So at that point in time, I went through a number of tests. Uh, he said, the only way we'll really know what's going on is if we do the catheterization. That's the only way you'll get any peace of mind. So I did. And fortunately for me, none of my blockages were severe enough that they needed to stent them. And as I was lying there in recovery for, I think you had to lie on your back for four or five hours, um, someone came over to me and said, they're doing a study over at NIH it's called, it's, you know, with ClinSeq, and you, you might be interested in this, and you might be a good person, a good candidate to go over there. So I called and called, and somebody finally called me back, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll participate. <laughs> well, they were busy doing research, you know. A lot of DNA out there, you know. So anyway, um, I, I went in and, and told them my family history, and, and, and they, were, they were a little giddy about the whole thing, to be honest with you, as, as I was going through and telling them, uh, you know, what, was, what had gone on and what was going on. And so they did a bunch of tests that day. And about a month or so later, I got a phone call, and 
I, I, could t I really didn't understand, but I could tell that they were excited about something. And they said, you know, we think we've come across something pretty, pretty interesting here. And I, okay, great. And they said, do you think your entire family would be willing to participate in a study? I said, sure, but they're not all here local. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, just see if they'll come in and, and they'll participate. So, you know, I got in touch with all of them and said, would you guys be game? Go in for a study. They're doing a, a study on, you know, heart disease and, and your DNA. And I said, yeah, okay, they'll go. And so I, I think from there it sort of has blossomed um, is the best way I can put it. Um, this study has gone layers and layers now, and I, in fact, I was just talking to Do and Dr. Biesecker before I came in, and they've done some, you know, um, you know, family history, and they've traced ancestry back to um, uh, Italy, and I think he's going to be going over there to make a trip, and uh, they've they've now tested extended family cousins and things of that nature, and I personally have been uh, fully sequenced, so. Um, I went through that, had no idea what it was. They said, wow, do you know what that is? I'm like, no, I have no clue what that means. What <laughs> so and Dr. Watson, I don't mean to, you know, I, I just, you know. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm a layman, right? I'm just, I'm just a guy. So anyway, um, they said, you know, w as we go through the sequencing, we, we may come across things that we find, do you want to know about them? And I thought to myself, well, yeah, I think I do. So they said, great. So I got a call one day right before Christmas, um, and they said, you know, can you come in? And we found something, and, and we want to talk to you about it. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, well, when do you want me to come in? Well, no, I'm leaving for the holidays. And, oh, well, then the doctor's away for a week after that, and so it'll be have to be like mid-January. And I'm like, oh, well, can you give me an idea what you found? <laughs> no, we're not allowed to do that. Oh, this will be a good Christmas, right? <laughs> so anyway, it, it turned out they found a condition called the HNPP, um, which uh, during the sequencing, um, uh, it, and if you don't know what HNPP is, that's okay because I didn't know either. Um, but basically, I get numbness. I get sporadic stages of numbness throughout my body. Uh, it had been going on since I was about 20 years old. I had no idea what caused it. Nobody else could tell me what caused it candidly. Um, and parts of my body could go numb for days or weeks or even months. And then ultimately it, it would go away. And so um, I got to learn a lot more about that and subsequently also got to learn some of the things that I potentially, I am a carrier for. Uh, most of them seem to be, uh, you know, obscure. So nothing really to worry about. But the, I've been asked before, how has this changed me? How has this impacted me? What does this mean? Um, and it's it's really been interesting because I, I did the study not necessarily for myself, um, maybe not even for my children, but for my children's children, because I thought there would be a point in time when you know you're born and there you have it, your blueprints right in front of you and you know what to do. And I liken it to using a GPS, right? So you're going down the road and you're going to run into traffic and your GPS is going to tell you to take a turn the other way. There's there's nothing you can do. You get, you're getting from point A to point B, but along the way you might. There might be better ways to go, right? There might be better things for us to do to prevent things or avoid certain situations. And so um, from my standpoint, I want to know. I know that there's a lot of people out there that I talk to that probably say, look, I don't want to know what's going on. But for me, it's been important to know. Um, it's been very eye-opening. I, I will say this. I, it, the energy and the excitement of everybody on the staff in, at the ClinSeq study has been amazing. Um, it's really, uh, they're just very excited about the work that they do, and from my perspective, that's pretty neat. So hopefully that's uh, a, a good background, probably took over five minutes, but that's my story, so thanks. Thanks, Dick. That's a tough act to follow. Um, <clears throat> so I, I got involved in this um, I'm not going to talk about clinical utility or even personal utility, but maybe existential utility. Um, I spent uh, from the age of 25 to 35 or so in a human genetics lab. I was a board eligible genetic counselor. Um, and then I studied a, a birth defect and we actually found some <coughs> Mendelian mutations 
Uh, we were not a CLIA certified lab. We could not give results back to those patients and families. Um, eventually we became a CLIA certified lab, um, but that sort of disconnect from the people we were studying uh, always sort of stuck in my craw. And um, so many years later, uh, I opened up Scientific American because there was a story in there called Genomes for All, written by a guy named George Church at Harvard. And I read that article and I felt like here was a guy who was articulating many of the things that I had felt um, that the time had come to sort of start thinking about how do we put this technology out into the world, um, at what point do we start sequencing healthy people, uh, like the gentleman to my right. And uh, so that sort of started this odyssey of me enrolling in George Church's personal genome project and getting my genome sequenced and um, living with it and making it public and thinking about the implications of it and spending a lot of hours in front of Excel spreadsheets um, and learning a lot about uh, um, next generation sequencing technology. Um, and so here I am. It was now, I think, uh, almost five years ago when the uh, founder of uh, 454, a new company of uh, high throughput DNA sequencing, came to my office. Uh, he telephoned me and said he wanted to. Uh, uh, they had this instrument that would be able to sequence me at a reasonable cost, and would I uh, be the first person to be sequenced? And uh, so I said yes right away. I didn't. Uh, and I said, uh, uh, you might as well make it public. Uh, but I don't want to know anything about apolipoprotein E <laughs> because uh, uh, I had a grandmother who died of Alzheimer's in uh, late 90s, no, mid 90s. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it was pretty awful. Uh, so I didn't want to know anything about it and uh, then really didn't think about it. And two years passed and uh, they called me up and said you're half sequenced and uh, uh, you know, we're working with the Houston uh, Genome Center, uh, Gibbs and the groups there, to, and George uh, Wenslock, who was uh, really key. And uh, uh, then with time, you know, they, I went down to Houston and there was publicity for the Genome Center for the Baylor College of Medicine. and. Uh, they told me I was heterozygous for a lot of bad genes. <laughs> yeah. uh, they said I had a uh, variant in the breast cancer, BRAC1. <laughs> okay, uh, but you know, I didn't know what that meant, and I don't think they did either. And, uh, but they told me I was homozygous for something like a terrible disease, a DNA repair, like Collins disease. I mean, you just don't reach my age if you had that. So I just didn't think about it. <laughs> and, uh, but I did think that if, you know, I didn't know which variant I had in the breast cancer gene, so I thought I should tell my nieces, because it is an awful gene. If you got the uh, Jewish variant, and we're not Jewish, so, you know, I didn't think I should have it. Uh, but uh, I wanted to find out. And, uh, but before calling them, uh, I called Mary Claire King and my sequence is uh, on the web, so she looked up and called me back, said you have a harmless Irish variant. How she knows that it's a, har a harmless Irish variant, but uh, you know, <laughs> so I didn't think about it again, didn't call my nieces, and uh, uh, so didn't think much about it, and uh, uh, then someone called me up and said, you haven't deleted or let me know that you haven't deleted enough from your sequence. By half a so we really can tell what your apolipoprotein E is. Do you want to know? <laughs> of course, I didn't want to know. <laughs> and I couldn't tell them, don't publish it. And, you know, 
<laughs> but then the story is more complicated. Uh, then uh, something actually useful happened. Uh, an article appeared from Craig Venture's lab, which compared his sequence with mine, with regard to the uh, cytochrome P450, the enzymes which metabolize drugs. And uh, uh, Craig was fine. But I had a very slow metabolizing uh, form of uh, 2P6 something, uh, the one which not only metabolizes beta blockers but antipsychotics. So uh, it's an important one. And I had been put on beta blockers and they had put me to sleep and I had to go off them. And then suddenly I had the explanation that uh, instead of taking one every day, I should maybe take one a week which I'm now doing, and it controls my blood pressure. So that was extremely useful fact, which I wouldn't have uh, known uh, without it. It was also the question came up where someone said, well, in getting yourself sequenced, you're going to know something about your children. Do you have the right to invade their privacy? Okay, no, no, I mean, that's the sort of thing that uh, these, you know, bioethicists have nothing better to do but to think about. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So, but it turned out my son, uh, I have a, a son who's schizophrenic, and he had been given antipsychotics after he had uh, hit the doctor who was a Freudian. And I would have hit any Freudian too. But anyways, he, he hit the doctor, a really miserable, fat little man. And uh, Chestnut Lodge, it's gone now, but it was a place outside of uh, <laughs> where you did. And, but he uh, went into neuroleptic malignant syndrome and almost died. And I think we now have the explanation. He didn't metabolize the drugs. And uh, so it's a very useful fact. Uh, he doesn't want his DNA sequence, but I know I was homozygous, so uh, he's heterozygous. And uh, it turns out probably the, uh, that some psychiatrists are really measuring this now before they give out psychotics to schizophrenic people. So it's quite important. And if I was younger and, you know, uh, uh, you know, living on an academic salary, I would certainly start a company to do uh, just the, uh, the cytochromes because uh, no one who, you know, goes to a doctor's office for blood pressure should uh, be given a drug without knowing whether you metabolize them. <laughs> I mean, uh, some people are... Uh, I'm a slow metabolizer. Some are super fast. And it never works. So it would probably be cost effective for the big health insurers to <laughs> uh, to do it. So uh, I think uh, you know. Uh, and then the only other thing is, uh, after a, you know, a remark I never intended to make, uh, Kerry Stephenson announced in the London Times that I was. Uh, he had looked at my genome, and I was 16% black and 4%, 6% Asian. <laughs> it didn't go with the pedigrees of my family. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he never published how he concluded I was 16% black and 6% uh, Asian. Uh, probably, you know, if the Asian probably means that, uh, you know, one of the Watsons in Tennessee consorted with an Indian woman. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but uh, I just ha have no interest in it. So, you know, I could have followed it up, and uh, I haven't sent my DNA to 23andMe, which could give me really quite a good ancestry. Uh, but I'm afraid I would, you know, I live with the myth that I'm only English, Scotch, and Irish, no Welsh. And uh, <laughs> so I don't want it disturbed. You know, it's a myth, and why? <laughs> Why destroy my myth? They might discover I had German blood or something, you know, that uh, I wouldn't have wanted. <laughs> so, you know, that's where I am. I'm remarkably uncurious. And, uh, but what I uh, have been surprised is that, you know, people really haven't looked at my sequence and written about me that they found out something. So there seems to be a total lack of interest in me as far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, people giving me good or bad. Then it turns out the Alzheimer's is interesting. The one thing that uh, 454 can't do is count T's, you know, 
And it turns out that uh, apolipoprotein E, uh, the key to it, the work of Alan Rosas, is adjacent to it is a gene called TOMD, uh, standing for the outer mitochondrial membrane, it's a pore. And uh, uh, people have either a long or, uh, depending, uh, it's very closely linked to the APO. So the three has its own poly, uh, Tom T polymorphisms. And there's a long sequence of about 50, which is very bad prognostic for Alzheimer's. If you had that long sequence and your three, you're going to, uh, no, probably 80% chance you'll get Alzheimer's. If you have the short one, you're pretty safe. And uh, so, those would have never been measured. <laughs> and you'd have to go back to Sanger sequencing to do it, or uh, uh, Pacific Biosciences uh, could do it. Uh, uh, Craig, having released his entire sequence, uh, 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 you know, it would be interesting looking him up to look at his Tom T. And if I were Craig, I wouldn't look at it. <laughs> because he's 60, you know, he's getting old. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. You know, people do, you know, uh, you know, a bad four with the long Tom T means you've got a chance of Alzheimer's in your 60s. Thanks, Jim. So you uh, Anyway, so that's <laughs> the story. You so, uh, but I think, just to come back to the general point, uh, I think DNA sequences will be known. Uh, I don't think the average person should really ever look at them. And I don't even think the average doctor can look at them. There's going to have to be consultants that the doctor says, what's the message from the genome that I should, uh, I can better treat my patient. And then the doctor has to show sense. I'm not telling you that you found out that you're going to die of Huntington's disease. <laughs> Because, you know, that's not good news. <laughs> so uh, there, there's got to be old-fashioned medicine of common sense by which you only tell people things which are useful. And don't tell things which uh, just are another reason for worry. I don't see any way to regulate it. It just depends on... Uh, I wouldn't want it regulated, and it's complicated enough. I don't know how you can even get a certificate that you know you're competent to look at a genome and predict someone's future. Great. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> So I think you teed up a really good question, and one that's a very interesting one has been debated since genomes were available to those of us who are lay public and, and even those of us who are scientists but working in various fields, and that is the um, who should know what when and who should be telling who what. Um, and, and I think of even there's a new tool out by 5AM Solutions called SNP Tips, and essentially you download your 23andMe sequence, and it flags every SNP you read about in any article, and you can click on it, and it shows you your variant. So more and more, there's tools that make it very much available to each of us to look at these things. And I wondered if, uh, if some of you would comment on what do you think you should know, who do you think should be telling you what you know or don't know, and also the, the kind of common perception, at least among the scientific community, that none of this is ready for what they say is prime time. I, I just talked to my parents last night about this and thinking about today and asking them what they hope to know when we, we get our results back in a few weeks. And uh, they're very interested in the uh, pharmacodynamic cytochrome results and their sensitivity to drugs. Yeah. Uh, they're in their 70s and they're starting to look at statins and other issues yeah. and want to know when findings come out about drug sensitivities or dosing, is it relevant to them? And I think it's a great you know, kind of personal use. And so they're, I think, looking for either their doctor to interpret the results or a professional, you know, that would be referred to, a qualified professional. I don't think that that um, occupation is really flushed out yet. It doesn't and so exist now. The, end, the web is going to do that for them. It's going to be these web services, 23andMe themselves. It's a monthly subscription model, whereas new findings are published. You can go reinterpret your genome, or like what you mentioned. And so I think there's a question about how, how, do, how accurate are they, or do they oversimplify? That's the risk that I'm wondering about. I would be very afraid to trust the web. Uh, 
you know, for something that's fairly important. I called Mary Claire King. I was lucky because she knew all the variants in BRAC1. Or, you know, those that <laughs> Myriad would let her know about. But uh, that the... Uh, I, I think we're going to have to have some experts that you, you just don't believe that, uh, you know, this database is perfect. I mean, the, the decisions are too important. And I would, you know, in the sense of a second opinion. Now, I was lucky and knew that, you know, the person who probably knew BRAC1 as well as anyone in the world and how you get this advice. But I do think there's going to eventually have to be human beings that you trust that they know all the polymorphisms and they're doctors and uh, they don't want to practice. But they sort of specialize in, you know, all the genes of your immune system or, you know, uh, they really know about arthritis. <laughs> you get help from them. So I think there's got to be a sort of specialties of people that uh, you can call, just that it's on the web and, you know, <laughs> who's put it there and how, you know, uh, you know, has the FDA certified it? And if they have, you know, I wouldn't, you know, the data is so old that you wouldn't want to use it. So, uh, you know, again, you know, uh, uh, the whole thing will favor people who are rich and who can get good advice. And with time, it will percolate down. Uh, I don't see much way to, uh, to change the situation. Can I ask if you see a difference between a physician that orders a test, returns it, doesn't know how to interpret it, and hands it to the patient? and the company that does it for profit and just returns it to the patient? I think that's irresponsible because, you know, if you give it to Eric, he, he can, you know, interpret it, but most people won't know what it means. It's, it's just too complicated. That's been my parents' experience in, in the, the um, diagnostic test in this brain disorder. It was ordered. The genetic test came back. The physician said, I don't know how to interpret this. And, handed it to my father. Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, you know, with time there will be virtually, a, whether you call it a medical specialty or something, and uh, a lot of people who don't like to deal with human beings, you know, are autistic people, uh, they can be in charge of the significance of the data, and they never have to talk to the poor person who's sick. No, I mean, I'm really lucky this is the first time in human history when these informatics people <laughs> who are on social have, a, we have a real need and they have jobs. If, if we open the data. What? Yeah. So, so you're saying this is a public works program? No, 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 no. I think you've got to eventually, uh, someone's got to, pay for someone to look at your genome. I asked George Church, I said, what does my genome mean? And he said, well, <laughs> someone, you have to give me money. It costs money to examine someone's genome. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and not in considerable sum. I mean, probably to get uh, your genome and uh, I can easily see ten or twenty thousand uh, dollars expended just to have someone look at it. And, uh, you know, in a sense, the cost will go up, uh, will both go up and down, because there's going to be so many more regions we can look, because we have some experience that that polymorphism means something. And uh, we can have this all on an NIH web, but I think uh, for something, you know, before you're scared shitless of learning something, you should get a second opinion. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> Lisa, your thoughts on that? Um, well, so in uh, quote unquote preparation for this, I went on Snipedia last night um, because all of my data are there. Uh, this was a website that was essentially started by two guys in their basement um, that links out to uh, the literature, all of the GWAS and genetic association literature. And so I have, I don't know, nine or 10,000 annotated genotypes there. And it makes some sub subjective evaluation 
um, these seem to be the most interesting SNPs, and it's based on allele frequency and severity of condition, et cetera. And so I looked at the top of the list. I said, I wonder what my most interesting SNP is. And it says, you are male. <laughs> um, Which we now yeah. know is important after this morning. I thought they nailed that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, it was followed by uh, some other sort of uh, phenotypically obvious, if not flattering, things like, um, you know, 7x risk of male pattern baldness um, and that sort of stuff. And so we can say that's frivolous and we don't need to know that and what's the point. Um, but I, I guess I see that as sort of an, an educational tool that, yes, I know I'm going bald, um, but here's an opportunity to maybe understand why um, and to to look at any of these uh, biochemical pathways that have been discussed so eloquently here today um, and to, to just get an, an insight into perhaps uh, at some superficial level um, how this affects me. Great. Good luck. Great. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> I've got time. <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of. I, I think I'm. I'm. I'm kind of in Misha's uh, camp here on this one. I again. I mean, th there. When I did the, the testing, it was really about my children and their children. So if there was something that I found, there was something that they could find that that potentially could impact them or would impact them. Is there something that? you know, could be done to prevent it or keep them from going down a, you know, a slippery slope with things. So, but it's been interesting and it's, it has been interesting to at least try to understand things and why they're happening to me and, and even just, you know, just the one condition. Um, but I, I, I think in listening to, to, uh, to um, Dr. Watson, it, it becomes evident that there are much more critical issues that you could find that I think would, would be of concern and I, I would be, you know, it's sort of like my general practitioner just putting me on a treadmill with an EKG machine saying, here, you have no heart disease. I mean, you know, I, I don't fault the guy, but by the same token, I probably could have found out years ago that, you know, maybe I could have done something to prevent it. So um, my, my other thing, if, if I could ask a question of what I, I wanted to ask, um, Dr. Sherry, and two things. One, um, you, you got the, the test for, you said for Christmas? You know, Valentine's Day is Monday. What do you got in preparation for that? <laughs> um, no, I, it, what, what was it, real, was it your, your parents that inspired this? I mean, did you, did you want to learn more about what c could cause this, you know, the, you know the, the brain issue? And I mean, what was it that really, and what are you hoping to find mostly? So, so the, the the brain issue is a hereditary generative condition. My father got tested for it last summer, and that was got me thinking about it. But there has been a 12-year uh, a enterprise, NIH, and the Genome Institute has led about finding these catalogs of variants that uh, Eric mentioned this morning so nicely. And you know, one of our tasks at NCBI has been maintaining that catalog, trying to relate it to disease. And so, you know, I've worked it. I'm one of those bioinformaticists, the asocial types that sit in a <laughs> computer room and um, try to put out accurate data. And uh, I've always wondered personally, you know, what would it mean to me? You know, I, I don't have any, you know, um, uh, personal knowledge of disorders that are coming up. There's not a lot of hereditary disease that I I'm, 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 think I'm facing. So it wasn't that curiosity. It was more of how would I, one is, you know, I see all of these people that volunteer and put their genotypes into public scientific repositories. You know, in working with that data, I should have that same level of commitment to the enterprise. And so it was a personal decision. I would put these data out just because it's, it's asking no more of anyone else than I would expect of myself. And, and the care I take in, in operating the database and making sure that, you know, all the consent is followed, you know, I want to understand that process from the participant side. And that's what I was saying. I've never been in a study, so this is a consumer-driven approach to that. And I think, as uh, Sharon was saying, there's going to be more of that. People are, are very interested. Um, the, the, the price was right, you know, at Christmas, and, and it wasn't like, you know, my, my parents were 
were particularly sick or anything. I was just like, you know, they have everything, but what's something you could give them would be knowledge of themselves. And, uh, and what we're finding is that it's starting a lot of conversations in our family about science, about, you know, how these studies are funded and what we're learning, and that's turned into discussion moments that I think are much broader than just the health question. It's about how public research really is relevant to American lives, and, and so I'm finding that as a, a hook. You know, they, they don't understand what I do. They haven't understood since graduate school. <laughs> now it's relevant, you know, and, and so I think that could be a, a broader opportunity for a lot of Americans. Great. How about uh, from the audience? We want to leave some time for you to ask questions. Uh, there's two microphones. Well, that was great. I was thinking of asking the panelists, except Dr. Watson, uh, if they are interested in getting resequenced. So that will tell us about the technology that has been used in the past versus new versus the effect of aging. Do you like to get resequenced? So I, I, I'm probably, you know, 80% of people my age don't, can't hear. So. <laughs> <laughs> I agree so, with you. So the you question is, would you like to get resequenced? No. <laughs> I mean, once you no, I mean the only thing would be to sequence these Tom sequences in the thing next to Apple, and uh, you know. But I, I no, I don't. I mean they did a pretty good job, and uh, <laughs> no, a anything which you know. Uh, it turned out the Cowden thing. Uh, that was in Edinburgh. They said. We looked at your sequence, you're one base pair off from the bad one. So I never, you know, I, I was never at risk. And, uh, but, uh, I, I try and not be a worrier. And so I try and avoid information which will worry me. So that's why, you know, I, I, whereas, uh, and I wanted to make the emphasis, these cytochromes are really quite important in medical treatment, and that's information which uh, probably we should, and I can't say any way except small companies doing it, uh, that uh, the average, that will reach the average person uh, fast enough. You know, but you, you should deal with cardiologists, you know, as a world, but, you know, who would pay for the information and so on, but uh, in my case it was important because beta blockers really do control, well, you know, partially, they work for, me, for blood pressure. And, you know, as I learned, 80% of people above 80 have really, uh, the blood pressure gets to the point where you have to control it. A so, short question uh, to, you know, uh, yeah. a short question to uh, Dell Center on clinical sequence participant. Did this uh, genome, gene that has been found for arterial calcification, has got any similarity with the peripheral arterial calcification gene that has been recently sequenced by Dr. Gall and his group in the rare genetic disease? <laughs> I think it was CD73, if I could recall. You had one question. Yeah. <laughs> go, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, you can, I, yeah. I, the answer is that I, oh, I just don't Rick. know. I, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> I'm Bert Gold. I'm at uh, National Cancer Institute. I must say, Dr. Watson, that uh, I, I saw you the first time when I was seven years old, and there's no question in my mind that if you want another career, that you could always do stand-up comedy. <laughs> you, are, you are absolutely as good as Jerry Seinfeld. Um, no, it, it gets you into trouble. Okay. Um, my question is for Dr. Watson. I've had the uh, great honor to look at his DNA in the region of the Duffy locus, and so I'm aware that you are at least a Duffy heterozygote, yes. which would suggest that, like the rest of us, you have some origin from Africa, but perhaps yours is a bit more recent than some of the rest of us. At some level, yet I hear you kind of disavowing or not being certain of that or identifying with Scottish or Irish ancestry more. So I'm wondering what you think. Do you think it was a DNA mistake or what are your thoughts? I have no thoughts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 
Kerry Stephenson has a, a reason to dislike me. I have reasons to dislike him. <laughs> I called him a leech once at a meeting. <laughs> you know, he, uh, he's... Uh, you affectionately. Know, he, uh, no. And there's a little... <laughs> <laughs> No, he's, you know, he's Icelandic, about six foot eight in height, and uh, he's, uh, you know, he's Craig Venter-like. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> he's a strong personality, and he's done, so, like Craig, he's done some good things. I'm not trying to say, you know, that he's uh, not. But, uh, you know, you don't publish in the New York Times without at least any of why he thinks I'm... You know, it did cause me to look at a few ancestors, but uh, pictures. I mean, you know. But, so, so very good reasons for where you get. But you know, it's sort of irrelevant. I, I, I'm just, I'm telling jokes because I, I don't frankly give a damn. <laughs> yeah. So. Next question. So I wonder if I could ask the panel for their thoughts on where they think this kind of data is going to be stored going forward, given the given the fact that there's probably going to be multiple vendors, multiple companies, multiple technologies being able to, to sequence your DNA. You could have multiple copies of your own sequence. How are you going to be able to keep track of this? Are you going to be able to, are consumers going to handle it themselves? Are they going to have to be some central repository that's trusted that can keep track of it for them? Uh, I, there's a lot of open issues there. I'm just curious what your comments are on that. I think they'll treat it like music download I think it'll be personal libraries or there will be private companies that step into that market. I don't think it needs to be centralized for any uh, reasons other than efficiency or, or convenience for individuals. You know, I don't think it's appropriate in a government database because it's not research, it's not funded for that. Um, I know that you know, what I'm having done and what others have done are gonna be in company databases. They may get sold and then that goes to some new company and you know, that's all in the informed consent. I plan on keeping a personal copy of it. You know, I'll download it and consolidate it that way. Is that your experience? I think it'll, for most people, it'll probably live in the cloud. And some people who are more um, worried about privacy will insist that it live, you know, on their nightstand or, or whatever, and not in a public or remote location. I just thought Apple was building an app for that. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell he's an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yes. Hi there. Um, I'm Layla. I'm a genetic counseling student here. Um, and so I wanted to just point out, I guess, um, something that I think you all maybe have in common, which is that when you decided to do this, you had a lot of, um, you had relationships, first of all, with the people who were doing it to you for some, you know, to some extent. And you had a lot of control over what you did and didn't see and who did it and, and sort of how the process unfolded. And I guess I wanted to know whether you think that's an early adopter's prerogative or do you think everybody has the right to that? And if so, if the latter, like how, how would you scale that up once this is more common? Sorry, very wordy. But. I couldn't understand. Rick, do you oh. want to try that one first? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it, for me, it was sort of, I, I'll be honest, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, it, and so, you know, to, to look at the, uh, and, and get access to the information, um, I'm just happy to share it uh, with whomever. Um, I would love to, you know, whenever I, I, I mean, I haven't actually seen any of the, the, the data, right? I just get the results. So I haven't actually looked at what it looks like yet. So. I'm sure if I asked, I could, um, but for me, it's it's just um, I'm, I'm happy to share it. I'm happy it's out there. I, I personally didn't have to pay for it. It was paid for as part of the study, so I'm very fortunate in that. My understanding is it's it's fairly expensive to do, uh, you know, full sequencing. So, I mean, I think that's the best answer I could give. I think it's an excellent question. Um, I think we are privileged as early adopters that we got a lot of hand-holding. Um, and then, of course, the more people do it, that becomes a difficult thing to scale. Um, how do you provide uh, flesh and blood genetic counseling for everyone? Um, and so this, I think, to some extent, gives rise to the 23andMe's of the world 
Um, and even the Personal Genome Project, there is a move away from um, sort of these intimate interactions with the neighborhood medical geneticist and more toward software uh, because I, I, I don't know how else you can scale up. Just add one point because this is where I'm at in the process and trying to decide how open to make the results. And my parents are very concerned about ensuring that I can see their data, but right now it's just our immediate family. We want a clear way to, you know, to share these with our extended families, other people get tested. And then, once we've seen the results, open it to the world. I don't think I'm ready to, you know, having no idea what's coming, to, to say it's, it's out there like personal genomes. You, I believe you make the commitment up front, right? It's a part of the consent. So I think that on the consumer model, it'll be more incremental. And to have that clearly uh, provided and architected, I think is essential for the ethics of this as it reaches the, the late adopters. So as you just mentioned, you'd be open to the possibility of sharing these data with the world. Um, would you share your genetic information with insurance companies? Uh, this may be a little bit early on in the process to ask this, but as somebody who's gone through this, you know, would you want your insurance companies to know about this? If not, where do they stand on this? Sure. <coughs> but uh, I think, you know, if, if I were, you know, uh, running one of these big projects, I would, uh, you know, sequence only people who are about 70 years old. Uh, no, no <coughs> for a reason is that you have their entire past medical history <laughs> rather than going, you know, the other way. And uh, they, on, on the whole, they, people are retired, they, you know, they're not worried about necessarily putting the information public. And I think unless we have some phenotypes correlated with genotypes, it's going to be hard to interpret it. So uh, if we emphasize too much secrecy, so I'm trying to get it. I didn't worry in part because of my age. You know, uh, they weren't going to, you know, I wasn't going to, they weren't going to find I had a gene for Huntington's disease. You know, I was probably had it. So, uh, 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 I think it's important uh, that a lot of people realize that they're more likely to benefit, like I benefited by looking on the cytochrome, so I could help my son, that's all. And that, uh, you know, you could uh, discover you're a carrier for cystic fibrosis, and therefore your children should look at it. So uh, uh, I think we could... I wouldn't worry about secrecy, uh, you know, for the most part. I think it's overblown. But, Other uh, thoughts on the insurance issue? Uh, well, I mean, with the, the exception of his, Jim's APOE locus, our genomes are both public, so insurance companies don't have to ask us. Yeah, but they don't have the Tom T. They really don't have the data <laughs> they need to interpret. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You have to really go back yeah. and now look at it, and then you can make uh, really pretty scary predictions. <laughs> Instead of, you know, if you have the three, it's 50 percent. Now if it's three long, 80 percent. So, you know, so uh, I think it's one that you really have to, uh, I, I would advise people not to learn it. <laughs> or, you know, not to have it released because, uh, yeah, well, well, there's so no do benefit. Even, do you think that the insurance companies would do anything with the information if well, they had Well, right now they're prohibited by law of using it. I think uh, this wonderful law that Francis got through, I think you can't be discriminated against. In um, health insurance and employment. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, like I think that's the least of our worries, frankly. Okay. No. I would just add that I think there's a difference between sharing my genetic information and the phenotypic information. And um, that was my mom's one concern on some of these, the 23andMe surveys, what they collect phenotypically. And I'll just say as an aside, she really objected to bra size being asked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the, I think the other point to make is that this can cut both ways. So if I know that I'm homozygous for APOE4, uh, and I have not shared that information with anyone, there's nothing to stop me from loading up on long-term care insurance. 
Um, so. Great. So we're going to take the last two questions and we're going to ask the panel to be very brief so that we can uh, get back on time and I think we're over here. Uh, Ahmed Kaplan in IDDK. Do you think sequencing the genome um, for everyone is something, is the right decision to do and telling them what they might have in terms of SNPs or possible genetic disease development? Um, because, for example, telling them that you have this disease once they have this disease is different from telling them you might be developing Alzheimer's or dementia in 20 years from now, knowing that it is only a prediction, not a certainty, because Again, it's other factors placed beside genetics, fact, environmental factors, and others. And maybe some people, they will not be able to take the news well, and they might lose it. Like, if I knew I'm going to lose my hair, I might take a million pictures before I lost it. So do you think that's a suitable thing to do for everyone, even if it came at a reasonable price, that everyone can do the genetic sequencing? Rick, you look like you uh, Yeah, I, that's a great question. I, I, the answer that I, I come down on is, no, it's not. It's not for everyone. And, and I think that there needs to be some filtering. I think Dr. Watson said it earlier of exactly what you do tell people, right? Um, because I think that could be, you know, look, there are people that are worriers. Dr. Watson is not one. He avoids the worry. That's good. Um, that's why he's, you know, what are you, 73 now? Um, <laughs> but my, uh, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> Well, I guess, what, you know, that's the point. Um, there are people, I think, that would, would deal okay with the information, and there are people that would not deal well with it. And, and certainly from the standpoint of um, if it was something really catastrophic, would, would you want to know that? I mean, that changes the way that I think you look and react to life every day, and that, that probably won't be, wouldn't be healthy. But if there was something that you could control, right, that, that, that you knew, that, that would be important to you, those things are, are the kind of things that I'd like to know about. If, if like you said, if I was going to have Huntington's disease, I, I don't know that I'd want to know that necessarily. No, I'd sue the doctor who would tell me it. <laughs> or, you know, unnecessarily uh, messing up my future life. Yeah, because there's no guarantee you'll get it. I mean, right. so I, I think you've got to have some common sense. What if What's someone it? wants to know? Oh, if they want to know, sure, you, you know. So, sort of a legal they question. Do it, but I mean, they take a big risk. But you know, finally, you're saying that you can tell me if I have, I'm going to get Huntington's disease. The chance of you're getting it is so low that it's not. Uh, but the, the Alzheimer's is a more real one. Sort of a legal question. There's considerable discussion in the academic and regular press about patenting of various sequences in the genome. If we knew Dr. Watson's specific genome that gave him the humor capability, could what do you feel about being able to patent that and uh, reserve it for just me, or I'll sell it? <laughs> well, I'd be rich. No, I got fired from being here for opposing patents. So I mean, I've had a long view of this thing that they're just. <laughs> They set back genetics. That's all I'm trying to say. They, they, they're, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but, all right. Uh, well, Misha, did you have a last word on that? Um, well, uh, as probably most in this audience know, um, Judge Sweet in New York uh, last year ruled against Myriad Genetics, um, some of their patents on the BRCA genes and that decision is now being appealed. I think most of these patents are set to expire this decade anyway. I, I expect gene patenting for monogenic diseases will probably die of natural causes. Um, maybe that's wishful thinking. Great. Well, we've heard from a variety of individuals who have uh, learned about their sequence in a variety of ways from a di variety of uh, different uh, processes. I think 10 years ago we wouldn't have been able to have this panel, so in a sense we've come a very far way. And this morning when I uh, listened to Eric give us a charge for a million genomes, or give it to other Eric, um, I think uh, we have not yet begun to explore what it means to do that in a social context. If we had said 10 years ago would we be able to sell books in every attic and basement across the world to each other, we would have said that's crazy. And we do it today quite easily. So I think we're going to also find that as these needs arise, and as individuals themselves step forward to be partners with NIH, with Wellcome Trust, with other entities around the world, that we are going to be able to solve these problems together. And we're really going to be able to build
hope and not hype. So I want to ask you to all join me in thanking the panel.